Bing Crosby's rise to fame was nothing short of meteoric. With his smooth baritone voice and charismatic on-screen presence, Crosby quickly became a household name in the entertainment industry. He starred in over 70 films, including classics like White Christmas and Going My Way, for which he won an Academy Award for Best Actor. In addition to his success in film, Crosby also dominated the music industry. He recorded over 1,700 songs, including timeless hits like Swinging on a Stars and Pennies from Heaven. His rendition of White Christmas remains one of the best-selling singles of all time. Despite his professional accomplishments, Crosby's personal life was plagued by tragedy and turmoil. He struggled with alcoholism and had a strained relationship with his first wife, Dixie Lee, who tragically passed away from ovarian cancer in 1952. Crosby's relationships with his children were also complicated, with his eldest son, Gary, accusing him of being emotionally distant and abusive. In his later years, Crosby's health began to deteriorate, and he suffered from various health issues, including a severe back injury that left him in constant pain. On October 14, 1977, Bing Crosby passed away from a heart attack at the age of 74, leaving behind a legacy that continues to inspire and entertain audiences to this day. Join us today as we delve into the heartbreaking real-life tale of the legend Bing Crosby. And please let us know which other legends you would like us to cover. Let's start by looking at Crosby's early life. Crosby was born in Tacoma, Washington on May 3, 1903, in a home his father constructed at 1112 North J Street. After three years, his family relocated to Spokane in eastern Washington state, where Crosby spent his childhood. In 1913, his father built a residence at 508 East Sharp Avenue, which now stands on the grounds of Gonzaga University, Crosby's alma mater, serving as a museum showcasing more than 200 items from his life and career, including his Oscar. Crosby was the fourth child among seven siblings, born to Harry Lillis Crosby, a bookkeeper, and Catherine Helen Kate. His mother was a second-generation Irish-American, while his father had Scottish and English roots, one of his ancestors, Simon Crosby, migrated from England to New England in the 1630s during the Puritan movement. Additionally, through another lineage on his father's side, Crosby is a descendant of William Brewster, a passenger on the Mayflower, 1567-1644. The future crooner's love for music became apparent at age six with the purchase of his first phonograph. Leading a normal, middle-class life, by the time he was in university, Crosby abandoned his aspirations to become a lawyer for his dreams of musical stardom. In 1917, Crosby began working as a property boy at Spokane's Auditorium, where he saw performances by Ul Jolson, who captivated him with his ad-libbing and parodies of Hawaiian songs. Crosby later praised Jolson's. Crosby later praised Jolson's delivery as electric. After graduating from Gonzaga High School in 1920, Crosby attended Gonzaga University for three years, but did not graduate. During his freshman year, he played on the university's baseball team. In 1937, the university awarded him an honorary doctorate. Gonzaga University now houses a significant collection of Crosby's photographs, correspondence, and other materials. Well, the iconic legend really entertained us and has gone down in history as one of America's most beloved entertainers. It's important that we take a look at his career journey before we get to discuss his personal life. In 1923, Crosby joined a band called the Musicaladers and performed at dances and on a Spokane radio station. The group disbanded after two years. Crosby and Al Rinker then joined the Clemmer Theatre as part of a vocal trio. They later became known as the Clemmer Trio or the Clemmer Entertainers. In 1925, Crosby and Rinker went to California and were hired by the Fanchon and Marco Time Agency. They gained popularity with their lively style and caught the attention of the Paul Whiteman organization. Despite initial setbacks, they found success with Whiteman and Crosby became the star attraction with his first number one hit in 1928. 
He eventually left Whiteman and pursued a solo career, signing a film contract and prioritizing his career after marriage issues. Bing Crosby made his solo radio debut on September 2, 1931 with 15 Minutes with Bing Crosby, which became an instant hit. He signed contracts with Brunswick Records and CBS Radio that same year. Some of his popular songs in 1931 included Out of Nowhere, Just One More Chance, At Your Command, and I Found a Million Dollar Baby in a 5 and 10 cent store. Crosby's popularity continued to grow, with 10 of the top 50 songs of 1931 featuring him. He ventured into films, starring in musical comedy shorts for Max Sennett and signing with Paramount. In 1932, he starred in his first full-length film, The Big Broadcast. Crosby went on to appear in nearly 80 pictures and signed with Decca in 1934. He became the first commercial sponsor on radio with Creme O Cigars and hosted the popular NBC radio program Craft Music Hall from 1936 for a decade. Crosby revolutionized popular singing by introducing a conversational ease known as the crooner style. He was influenced by Louis Armstrong and insisted on casting him in a film, expanding opportunities for African Americans in the film industry. During World War II, Crosby entertained American troops with propaganda broadcasts in German, earning him the nickname Der Bingles among German listeners and making him a top choice for boosting GI morale. Bing Crosby, an American entertainment legend, achieved unparalleled success and popularity. He had a massive fan base and accumulated great wealth, becoming a beloved figure in America. His records, including the iconic White Christmas, sold millions of copies in the United States and Great Britain, inspiring other artists. Crosby had a unique talent for making unfamiliar songs become instant hits. Even after a decade, his past records continued to sell exceptionally well. Crosby represented the amicable, hilarious citizen of a free America, captivating soldiers abroad and foreigners. Despite uncertainties, he found joy in his own singing, regardless of public demand. Crosby was honored with the Academy Award for Best Actor for his role in Going My Way, 1944, and received a nomination for its follow-up, The Bells of St. Mary's, 1945, alongside Ingrid Bergman. He was among the first six actors to be nominated twice for portraying the same character. From 1944 to 1948, Crosby held the top spot as the leading box office draw for five consecutive years. In 1946, he reached the peak of his screen career by starring in three of the year's top five highest-grossing movies, The Bells of St. Mary's, Blue Skies, and Road to Utopia. In 1963, he was honored with the inaugural Grammy Global Achievement Award. Crosby's legacy includes having three stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, recognizing his contributions to motion pictures, radio, and audio recording. His enduring partnership with Bob Hope in The Road to Films from 1940 to 1962 remains a notable highlight. Through his pioneering work in audio recordings, Crosby applied the same meticulous approach to his radio programs as seen in motion picture production, setting a new standard for the industry. Beyond his musical endeavors, Crosby played a key role in advancing technologies such as early audio tape recording and the development of videotape. He also ventured into television station ownership, horse breeding, and co-ownership of the Pittsburgh Pirates baseball team, which achieved two World Series victories under his tenure in 1960 and 1971. Now, as for some facts that you didn't know, we will start with his alcohol addiction and everything bad that came with it. During the late 1920s and early 1930s, Bing Crosby's relationship with alcohol became a significant struggle. The era of prohibition, which banned the sale and consumption of alcoholic beverages, posed a challenge for many individuals, including Crosby. Unfortunately, his battle with alcoholism led to a drinking-related car crash that resulted in a brief stint in jail. However, by 1931, Crosby managed to regain control over his drinking habits. 
He recognized the detrimental effects of alcohol on his life and made a conscious effort to overcome his addiction. This marked a turning point for Crosby, as he began to prioritize his health and well-being. In a surprising turn of events, during a 1977 interview with Barbara Walters, Crosby expressed his belief that marijuana should be legalized. He argued that legalizing marijuana would allow authorities to regulate its market more effectively, potentially reducing the associated risks and criminal activities. This viewpoint showcased Crosby's progressive thinking and willingness to challenge societal norms. In 1999, an article published in the New York Post claimed that FBI files linked Crosby to the Mafia since his youth. These allegations suggested a long-standing association between Crosby and organized crime. However, when the files were eventually released in 1992, they showed no concrete evidence of such ties. The only mention of a potential connection was a chance encounter Crosby had with a person associated with the Mafia in Chicago in 1929. The FBI memos discredited the claims made in threatening letters Crosby had received, further undermining the allegations against him. The files revealed that there was no substantial evidence to support the notion that Crosby had any significant involvement with the Mafia. The claims made in the New York Post article were largely unfounded and lacked credibility. Despite these controversies, Crosby's legacy as a legendary entertainer and his contributions to the music industry remain intact. His ability to overcome his struggles with alcohol and his progressive stance on marijuana legalization demonstrate his resilience and forward-thinking mindset. Crosby's impact on popular culture and his enduring influence on music continue to be celebrated to this day. Crosby was married twice. His first wife was actress and nightclub singer Dixie Lee, whom he was married to from 1930 until she died of ovarian cancer in 1952. They had four sons, Gary, twins Dennis and Philip, and Lindsay. While Crosby managed to overcome his own drinking problems after they tied the knot in 1930, Lee struggled with alcoholism. Experts suggested that the couple's twin sons, Dennis and Philip, might have been affected by fetal alcohol syndrome due to their mother's heavy drinking. Throughout the late 1930s and 1940s, Crosby's home life was overshadowed by his wife's alcohol abuse. Despite his efforts and the help of specialists, he was unable to help her overcome her addiction. Frustrated with Dix's drinking, Crosby even requested a divorce in January 1941. In the 1940s, he faced challenges balancing his career while also being present for his children. Crosby was involved in one confirmed extramarital relationship during the late 1940s, while he was still married to his first wife Dixie. In her 1988 autobiography As I Am, actress Patricia Neal recounted a cruise to England with actress Joan Caulfield in 1948. Caulfield expressed her desire to marry Bing Crosby, revealing that she was in love with an older married man just as famous as Gary Cooper. Neal and Caulfield bonded over their shared experiences, but Neal kept her own secrets close. D in History it reveals the inner turmoil and conflicting emotions that Crosby experienced as he navigated his love for Caulfield, his commitment to his Catholic faith, and his loyalty to his wife and family. The diary entries from Violet and Mary Barsa provide a unique perspective on Crosby's activities during this time. They offer a glimpse into his social life, his romantic involvement with Caulfield, and the presence of Caulfield's mother during their outings. This suggests that Crosby's relationship with Caulfield was not a simple affair, but rather a complicated situation involving multiple individuals. The revelation that Caulfield herself admitted to having a relationship with a married film star, later confirmed to be Crosby, adds another layer of complexity to the story. It suggests that Crosby was seriously considering leaving his wife and children to be with Caulfield, despite the potential backlash from his Catholic faith. Crosby's decision to seek guidance from Cardinal Francis Spellman demonstrates his desire for moral guidance and clarity in his situation. However, Spellman's advice, 
Comparing Crosby to the virtuous character Father O'Malley made it clear that divorce was not an option for someone in Crosby's position. This must have been a difficult blow for Crosby, who was torn between his love for Caulfield and his commitment to his faith. The involvement of Crosby's mother in the decision-making process further highlights the complexity of the situation. Her strong objection to the idea of divorce likely weighed heavily on Crosby, adding to the internal struggle he faced. In the end, Crosby made the difficult decision to end his relationship with Caulfield and remain with his wife. This choice demonstrates his commitment to his family and his willingness to work through the challenges they faced, including Dix's struggles with alcoholism. Following his wife's passing, Crosby had romantic relationships with model Pat Sheehan, who later married his son Dennis in 1958, and actresses Inga Stevens and Grace Kelly before marrying actress Catherine Grant, who converted to Catholicism in 1957. They had three children, Harry Lillis III, Mary Frances, and Nathaniel. Through the diary entries of Violet and Mary Barsa, readers are able to gain a deeper understanding of the man behind the iconic voice and the challenges he faced during this tumultuous period in history. After Crosby's passing, his eldest son, Gary, penned a scathing memoir titled Going My Own Way, painting his father as harsh, distant, and both physically and emotionally abusive. Despite admitting to instances of physical discipline, Gary's siblings distanced themselves from his allegations, refusing to corroborate them publicly or privately. Contrary to his brother Gary's accusations, Crosby's younger son Philip refuted the claims about their father. When Gary's memoir was released, Philip publicly dismissed him as a whining crybaby who was constantly looking for a fight. However, Philip did acknowledge that Crosby believed in using physical punishment. In an interview with People magazine, Philip clarified that they only received punishment when it was warranted. Lindsay Crosby expressed his support for his brother Gary's book, hoping that it would dispel old lies and rumors. Unlike Gary, Lindsay focused on remembering the good times with their father and choosing to forget the difficult moments. Lindsay stated that he never expected affection from their father, and it didn't bother him. He emphasized that their father was a good parent and they were raised to respect their parents. Lindsay believed that Gary wrote the book to reflect his own life experiences and didn't see it as an attack on their father. Dennis Crosby stated that his older brother Gary was the most severely treated amongst the four boys. Gary's first wife, Barbara Cosentino, mentioned that she was unaware of the whippings mentioned in Gary's book and never witnessed any mistreatment between him and his father. Stephen Crosby, Gary's adopted son, believed that the book was his father's way of addressing certain aspects of his life, including the typical family conflicts that occur between parents and children. Bing Crosby's brother, Bob, described him as a strict parent, like their own mother and father. However, Gary Crosby, Bing's son, clarified that his father was not abusive or cruel, but rather a typical father of that era. Gary Giddens, the author of a biography on Bing Crosby, disputes the reliability of Gary Crosby's memoir and questions the abuse stories. Bing Crosby's will established a blind trust to keep his sons out of trouble, and they received a monthly allowance from a trust set up by their mother. Unfortunately, Lindsay and Dennis Crosby tragically died by suicide, while Gary Crosby died of lung cancer and Philip Crosby passed away from a heart attack. In January 1974, Crosby recovered from a life-threatening lung infection and returned to the music scene, releasing albums and performing concerts. However, in March 1977, he fell off the stage and ruptured a disc in his back, requiring a month-long hospital stay. Despite this setback, Crosby remained determined and made a successful comeback performance in August 1977, on the same day Elvis Presley passed away. During a concert at the Concord Pavilion, the power failed, but Crosby continued singing, captivating the audience. He also performed a televised concert in Norway and embarked on a concert tour of Britain, including a stint at the London Palladium. While in the UK, he recorded his final album, Seasons, and filmed his last TV Christmas special with David Bowie. 
Crosby's final concert took place on October 10, 1977, and a few days later, he traveled to Spain to play golf. During a round of golf, he sang for construction workers before suffering a sudden and fatal heart attack. Crosby was laid to rest in Holy Cross Cemetery in Culver City, California, five days later.